Thank you very much. We'll just uh, not mirroring my display. It's cool. Awesome. So thank you for that intro, Brian. Yeah. So I'm a full stack um, developer. Uh, previously, I was working at a company called MuleSoft on their UI UX team. Um, and yeah, we're going to talk about some React component stuff. But first, what talk would be complete um, without a little bit of history? I was also told to make this first talk really energizing. So what better than history? <laughs> so let's start. So a long, long time ago, 65 million years ago, silicon was forming deep below the planet's <laughs> surface. A great meteor hit the planet, spread the silicon dust across the globe. Dinosaurs learned how to harness the silicon <laughs> and build advanced technology. But wars broke out, which ultimately led to their extinction, which we all know about. Fast forward to present day. <laughs> now, that same silicon lives in our phones and is used to render React components. Amazed? Baffled? Perplexed? Me too. Um, yeah, so do I have your attention? All right. <laughs> All right, cool. So let's actually get into the talk. Uh, so for the past several years, um, I've been on a quest for basically the perfect uh, UI platform, the perfect UI stack. What could we build uh, that would be ideal for larger projects in uh, enterprise organizations, specifically working across multiple teams uh, and multiple departments within that organization? So there's no shortages of solutions out there. Um, you know. Take everything that I'm saying with a grain of salt. These are the, the, th the learnings that I've had over the past three years now, building uh, two different component libraries for organizations. Uh, but yeah, and this uh, picture is actually all of the JavaScript libraries out there um, released this week. <laughs> so cool. So first, like, first, close your eyes and imagine, what, what's your perfect setup? What would be ideal, your ideal stack? And I'll jump into mine. So first, a little bit of background, like where we were at at MuleSoft um, and why this all kind of came about. So it, it started like, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with this sort of scenario where your application and maybe your marketing site look completely different. Uh, maybe you have a series of different applications that are just, the, the UI, the, it doesn't feel cohesive. And it's more like this. So at MuleSoft, we had uh, nine, I believe, different products that were built at different times, all kind of slightly different. So the experience wasn't quite uh, what we'd want. Um, so basically, we were set out upon this journey to solve that. So my ideal uh, scenario is, you know, imagine a, a scenario where you have a single code base for your marketing site, your, your blog, your web application, mobile apps, or even inside legacy applications. Um, and this is set up, set up for uh, teams to use um, across your organization. One that's organized with every single layout, icon, style, and building block in one place for developers to just pick up and use. One that is in sync and when you update something in one place, it propagates across the different applications, across the different uh, pieces of your ecosystem. And then it's also self-contained. So what if your CSS could be self-contained and guaranteed not to cause conflicts? This is the golden goose that many of us strive for. And then also, uh, you know, it needs to be a scalable solution, both from a people perspective of, you know, can people maintain it? Um, and then also from a technology perspective, is it performant? Um, you know, how much uh, code am I shipping down to the client, et cetera? So this is actually, you know, what we're chatting about today, components, what, <laughs> what React Conf would not be complete without a Lego slide? So uh, components. Are, and component-based architectures are really what React opened the doors for um, when it first came out and uh, was basically the way that we went um, 
it's porting over uh, Angular 1 applications into this kind of React component-driven uh, paradigm. And that's what I was hired to do. Um, but it all starts with a design system. <clears throat> so this is like an idea that's kind of getting more and more popularized, uh, where a design system is basically a way to formalize your UI tonality and brand like all in one place. So uh, you don't run into that multi-sock situation that we saw earlier. Um, you know, you could also you know equate it to like brand guidelines, if you will. There are a ton of different examples out there. Um, Lightning Design System was one of the earliest um, and and really uh, comprehensive. Recommend checking that out. I'm sure most of you are familiar with Material UI, um, Google's kind of design language. Uh, the one that we created over at MuleSoft, you can check out at ux.mulesoft.com. Um, we're basically it's. Uh, uh, library of all the different UI components that we're using. Um, that's uh, kind of the documentation site, a live code editor, and then all of the different pieces that go into um, a design system, which I'm going to jump into. And then this, the uh, other one that we're building right now at serverless is uh, over here on Netlify. Shout out to Netlify. Woo! Um, <laughs> yay! <laughs> Uh, yeah, so it's a very similar concept. You have uh, all of your components in one place, all documented with the prop types, and a way for developers to actually see and use live examples. So uh, they, can, they can literally kind of copy and paste code and be off to the races. And this isn't only for um, developers. This is for like really anybody on the team that knows a little bit of code. They can play around with this stuff and, and kind of get off the ground running quickly. Um, I have a blog post on many, many more. There are so many uh, React component libraries now that you know this post needs to be updated. But there are a ton out there, really, a lot of really good examples. So what, what exactly lives in a design system? Well, these cool guys, for sure. But also, like, your documentation. So having a, a place where uh, developers can actually play around with the uh, code and components without having to install something locally. Um, usage examples. So like, how do I actually use this? So it's one thing to see your, your prop types, but it's another thing to actually see it in use with you know, actual uh, click handlers and what have you. Um, platform guidelines. So uh, what are the UI paradigms uh, of your application? What do setting screens look like? What do modal interactions look like? What are the primary and secondary colors? What are tertiary colors? That sort of thing. Um, as well as, yeah, UX guidelines, which kind of fall into that. So that's, that's kind of like my ideal stack. Um, that's what we were striving to do. But all this stuff sounds like, oh, pie in the sky, fancy stuff. How do we actually do this? Let's actually look at real code and uh, real examples. So um, this is how uh, we're going to run through these, um, how to build a component library for like larger consumption. Um, but it basically, yeah, we'll, we'll go through each one of these as we step through. So the first one is breaking things down. So you take a look at any piece of your UI, and you, know, you basically see, start to see the tiny, tiny pieces. You can break every single thing down on your screen into tinier and tinier pieces. So here we see everything is a component. Um, everything can be extracted into a tinier piece and reused. And then what, how can we actually take those tinier pieces and actually compose them together into larger fragments for reuse as well, which are also components technically, but um, they're a little bit um, larger. Uh, and serve specific use cases rather than the tiny individual elements. And this kind of dovetails into an idea uh, called Atomic Design by a guy named Brad Frost. Really amazing book. Recommend checking this out. Um, very similar concept where you have the tiny, tiny building blocks he calls atoms. Those compose into molecules, into organisms, into templates, and into the actual UI pages. Um, and if you design your kind of design system around this, um, it's really easy to scale and maintain. Uh, and he has a site, patternlab.io, which is kind of a, a tool to use uh, around this as well. But what it looks like is, so here we have the tiny little pieces, so a label, an input, and a button. Those might compose together to create a search box, for example. 
But you can see, and this might compose into another piece that's you know, a, a larger fragment called your header, which might compose into a, an actual page in your marketing site or into your actual application. So really, the moral of the story is everything is a component. I'm a component, you're a component, we're all components. Um, I think everyone here gets that, so let's move forward. The anatomy of how we actually constructed these um, and, and how they pull together into the um, UI library is we have our component file, um, we're exporting that. We have our CSS, and I'm gonna get into how we do CSS um, to avoid all of those things that I talked about earlier. And um, then we also have our testing right next to our component and also the usage examples. Like you can't ship a component unless you have a usage example. Um, that's just kind of table stakes. You should always document your code and what better way to document something than actually uh, showing someone how to use it. And then at serverless, we have a very similar approach where uh, our site is completely open source. It's made entirely out of React components. It's a static site um, built with, under the hood we're using Phenomic as our static site generator. But everything you see here is a component um, and then we kind of compose things together to uh, build up an actual marketing site. Um, we actually have kind of two UI libraries right now, but that's another story. That's another talk. Um, yeah, so we have our fragments, layouts, and pages. And then for our actual application that we're building, we have the actual um, UI library that we're kind of building out, like I mentioned. So what, uh, you know, talk, <laughs> Whenever you mention CSS, you have to show this Peter Griffin slide because it makes people angry <laughs> and they tweet about it and that's what we want. So tweet about this and say, I can't believe I saw this again. Um, yeah, so handling styles. Um, you know, we had some challenges with what we, what we needed to do, uh, specifically at MuleSoft, where we had to build a component library that would um, not that, that would actually live inside of an, a legacy Angular 1 application. So we're rendering React inside of Angular 1, not recommended, <laughs> not recommended to do. You can do it. Um, so what we needed was complete style isolation. Uh, nothing could collide into our components. Um, so we'll talk about how we did that. And this is a true story, uh, it, way before his time, Honest Abe, Cannot tell a lie, and I, I agree. <laughs> the biggest problem we face today. So how do we solve this? So uh, we use post-CSS and CSS modules. So you know what are these things? My JavaScript fatigue senses are tingling. Um, there are many, many flavors of how to do CSS with React. Uh, again, you can choose your own. I'm gonna talk about why we went with post-CSS and CSS modules. Um, and there's a link to like, yeah. If you want to know all about that stuff of why, there's a link to the slides and a, a separate talk. Um, but real quick, what it actually does, what it looks like. So we can localize styles with post-CSS and CSS modules, where basically we have our, um, we're importing our styles, button.css, and then we're just pulling off the named classes off of that and then putting those into an actual class name, which, you know, people that use uh, uh, CSS in JS, they probably hate this, but I'm gonna explain why we do it. Um, and yeah, we just write normal CSS, vanilla CSS. This was a huge uh, thing for us because we have designers and stuff that can write CSS. They can't write JavaScript. Um, they had no uh, inclination to learn JavaScript. They just wanted to write CSS. Um, and then what that actually, uh, compiles down to is your localized styles. So CSS modules will import your style. What you get is actually an object with the localized styles there. So basically what you're getting is BIM syntax for free. And you can also, when you export these components, you can actually export this without the hash at the end. And it can, uh, the styles can literally be reused in like if someone was writing an app in just HTML. Why would they do that? Who knows? But if you do need to support multiple kind of um, uh, frameworks, et cetera, this is one way to do that. So yeah, so basically we have the localized class. So now nothing is gonna touch or mess up my style. Um, 
and versus the collision city where if we were just using normal classes. Like, this is pretty basic stuff, but um, really important for what we needed to do. Um, and I'll talk about some other reasons why this is super important. Um, so many things that post-CSS does, I'm not going to go into all of these. I'll just highlight a few. So you can use um, CSS4 today. You can polyfill Flexbox back to IE8. You can lint for accessibility rules, like are your, is your contrast actually accessible? Um, you can actually reset all inherited properties. So this is, uh, you know, um, uniquely namespacing your classes is one thing, but resetting the inherited properties is another. And that's actually um, really important for making sure my thing is going to look like my thing 100%. Um, and that's with the initial all uh, property which is a CSS4 spec. You can uh, critically inline CSS uh, uh, amongst a million other things. Um, but yeah. So do you really need this? Uh, if you're working on a team, I'd say yes. If you're including any third party CSS, like Bootstrap or anything, you want to you know, isolate yourself from that. Um, are you running markup inside of a third party environment? The answer for everyone is yes, because the browser is a third-party environment. And any, any number of extensions could collide into um, what you're trying to do, especially ad blockers, if your business relies on that um, sort of thing. Um, and then the other really cool benefit about PostCSS is it, gives, it actually transpiles your CSS into an abstract syntax tree, which gives you, it's basically like Babel for CSS where you can do any sort of transpilation that you want. Um, and that's really powerful. Uh, any, any transformation you want using JavaScript, any sort of JavaScript library. And we'll go into that. Um, yeah. So cool. So that's, that's how we do uh, CSS. Um, how do we handle uh, global assets? So variables, mix in, and like icons. So icons, um, they're all powered by JavaScript. Uh, again, using uh, PostCSS as the engine here. So what that looks like is you just require in the uh, plugins that you might want to use. If you're using less or SAS, you can pull that in as well. Um, or just use vanilla CSS. It's up to you. Um, this is yeah, how you would import it and then use it in Webpack. What's really cool about this is your variables living in a JavaScript file means I can do any sort of manipulation to these values that I want. I can put in custom math to calculate my font sizes, whatever. Um, and because it's a JavaScript file, it's accessible within any of my components if I do want to do inline styles or any, any CSS in JS. But it's also accessible uh, in the CSS files themselves. Um, similarly, with mixins, same, same idea where uh, you know, instead of having to rely on what SAS or less give you as mixins, I can literally, literally write any JavaScript function I want, use any NPM package that I want to trans, trans uh, you, you know, pile my CSS into whatever I want it to do. Uh, so it's kind of like raw flexibility. Uh, and what it looks like, um, basically in the CSS, you just import a mixin. This is just one that's uh, declaring fonts and then variables. There's so many flavors of how you can do this. It's up to you. Again, you can use uh, less in SAS as well, if that's what you, you're used to. And then inside of the um, JavaScript, like I mentioned, because it's a jo uh, JavaScript file, we can use that to inline styles or use it in uh, CSS and JS. But that is like how we actually handle um, that piece. The icons, um, so icons, we uh, needed to kind of ship these around to every application. Uh, we went with um, SVGs. You should use SVG icons both for accessibility. Um, they're also typically lighter than um, font icons. And there's a bunch of really awesome things that you can do because it's uh, you know, a DOM element that you can manipulate. You actually have the ability to do really awesome like animations or change um, colors of icons dynamically, multicolored icons, etc. Uh, whereas a font icon, you can't really do that. Um, and the way that we did that is, yeah, so the designers make the SVGs in whatever they want, Illustrator, etc. Um, a build script runs all the SVGs through Webpack. 
Um, we're using the, the SVG store plugin. It'll optimize all the SVGs, pull out all the extraneous stuff from exported from Sketch or Illustrator or whatever, and create a sprite. So when you create an SVG sprite, you can simply use it by using the SVG tag and referencing the uh, name of the icon with by ID. So instead of having to inline your icons a bunch of different places, which adds to the weight of the DOM, especially if you're server-side rendering, you can, you can simply render the sprite you know, in, uh, right before the closed body tag and just reference the ID uh, of that SVG. And this kind of gave us like, um, you know, this is the worst chart ever that I made in Keynote, but uh, basically it gave us this really uh, powerful leverage to um, have everything in one place. And um, when we needed to make an update, we can make an update to the component library, to any variables or any like global color changes, et cetera. We could do that in one place and then ship that uh, across the board um, to all the consuming applications. So it's, it's basically powerful leverage that um, typically is pretty difficult. So the next piece is like documentation. Every developer's favorite, favorite thing. Everyone loves documentation and writing it. Woo! So how do you do this? So we built like the, the ux.mulesoft.com is a custom uh, built tool. I'm, I'm actually using those two libraries down at the bottom if you want to check them out. Uh, but it's basically just Re React Router, and I'm rendering, I'm using React um, DocGen to parse all my components, and then I get the JSON back, and then I just render the different components and examples. Um, a really popular one that most people are using these days is React Storybook. Check that one out. Um, but yeah, it's really up to you uh, how you want to do this. But having a live uh, code playground is, in my opinion, key so people can actually try out and see what all the different values and seeing all the different states of a given um, component. So if you go to ux.mulesoft.com, you can see in the buttons component every single possible variation of that button. Um, so it's, it's easy to kind of keep everything in check and for people to see what's actually available to use in their application. Another thing that uh, we use um, very heavily uh, this is a package that I wrote, but it's, it's called Markdown Magic. What it does is it will, oh, it's magic. <laughs> what it does is basically uh, in your Markdown, you can use a comment to uh, a comment block, which is invisible in GitHub. You know, you can't see it. Uh, and then when you run like, it through Markdown Magic, it'll actually auto-generate content inside of that block. So this is just a quick example of like, this will automatically generate a table of contents for your readme file just by putting this kind of content block there. Um, that's kind of a built-in thing. You can also pull in source code. If, you, if, you, you know, if you've ever had to manually update table of contents or update like a code example in a markdown file, like don't do that anymore, it's crazy. You can simply just add in this content block, give it the path to the code, it'll inline it for you when you run Markdown uh, magic on your project. Um, you can also use custom transforms. We use this very heavily for like almost all of our repositories. Um, this is actually an example um, where basically uh, I have a custom transform. It's called serverless examples table. And what it does um, is it generates that Markdown table for me. If you've ever had to maintain a Markdown table, it's not, it's, it's a nightmare. Um, so don't do that anymore. And what that actually looks like, it's a simple JavaScript function that says, hey, read these um, examples, then grab the package.json data, then loop through it and create a markdown table for me and export that. So if I ever add anything new to this project and just run the docs command, boom, it's automatically added into that table. And then going a step further, um, you know, generating your docs directly from source code. I'm a huge believer in this, um, where if your docs, the further away your docs live from your actual source code, the more out of date they're gonna be. Um, so what this does is actually, um, it, it uses the docs, um, it, it uses, it parses doc blocks with the docs um, package, 
and will actually use the doc blocks from my source code. And this is actually the Markdown Magic project. Automatic, auto generates its own documentation. Um, uses the doc block that'll actually you know, output into my comment block of the, the actual stuff that I want to show in the, the readme file, and boom, there it is. So whenever I want to update my documentation, I just run, I, it's just an NPM script. So you can run it as a CLI, or you can run it as a, a library if you have custom transforms. And again, a custom transform can be anything you want. You can call to a remote server, you can do like literally anything. Um, but yeah, so recommend checking that out if you want to you know, have better docs. Um, so how do we distribute um, these components and uh, you know, share these around? So we're obviously using Webpack and NPM for this. We're using a private NPM registry. That's just the implementation detail. The way that we build the components is actually super important. Uh, with tree shaking, it's a little bit better now. But we build the individual components separately. Um, and that's super important because if you export everything into like one thing, um, unless you have tree shaking and it's set up correctly, you're going to have a huge bundle. And if, if one consuming app uses one of the components, it'll pull in the entire component library. And you add a lot of weight. So you want to avoid that. So we decided on using a flat directory structure um, to actually um, build those components. And this is what that looks like. It'll, it builds out to a lib folder with all of the components in a flat structure. And then in any of the components, it'll just reference that file. So instead of inlining you know, the icon into the button, into the action button, into the table, like everywhere that it's used, um, which is kind of the default behavior, um, we actually just reference that file. So when a consuming application uses this, they simply pull in what they need. Similarly, with uh, CSS, we do the same thing. So instead of inlining the CSS everywhere, um, over and over and over again, um, you only use it once. And yeah, so the other thing that we're doing is monitoring com uh, component usage. So you know, when you're making changes to a component's API, you want to know where it's actually being used. So this is a super simple Webpack plugin. I think it's Webpack 2. <laughs> so I don't know, you might have to update it for a new one. But uh, basically what it does is uh, it parses through and sees what components are being used. And then it'll actually just call a Lambda function and report, hey, this app, the package.json name, is using these components. So like when we actually go to make a change to the button or the table or whatever, we know it's being used in these places. So you know, whatever change we're making, make sure it doesn't break whatever is happening over there. You should be you know, doing semantic versioning and what have you, but you know, in reality, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you, can, you can quote me on that. Um, yeah, so, so what were some lessons learned? So some lessons learned were like, you really want to be vigilant with your component APIs. Prop sprawl is, is very real. And it's, it's, you know, with more and more people touching something, they want to add their own thing. Or one property doesn't do exactly what they want, so they add another one. And then you get into this scenario where your documentation, your component has like 30 different things that it like takes in. You want to avoid that at all costs. Uh, the way to get around that is if they have a, a specific use case, instead of them adding a prop to that base component, they can, have a, they can uh, consume the component and just have a higher order component with that property um, uh, kind of passed in or, or like doing what it needs to do. Um, yeah, so don't add things before you have specific use cases. Like this was a problem that we ran into and we had to back a lot of it out. Um, name, things, uh, name things well and agree on a standard. I'm going to go into this in the next slide. Prop type kind of best practices. Um, when in doubt, use custom component renderers. Like this was, <laughs> I made this uh, slide a while ago before render props was a word. So it's render props now, but if you do want, like providing flexibility of how things actually render, make it so you don't have to like add properties for every given thing. Um, it adds a lot of flexibility into the actual consumer. Um, and then if you see that pattern being used over and over and over again, um, then maybe it's, it's actually worth putting into the API or worth putting that composed component into the shared component library. Um, 
The other thing that we did not do is we didn't set up linting first. <laughs> that was just to move fast, but it actually was bad at the end. Um, and we had a lot of things that we had to go clean up. Um, the other thing that you want to do is, you know, test for server-side renderability early and often. So um, even if you're not doing server-side rendering, you might someday. Um, and especially if you're going to be using your components in a static site uh, React renderer, uh, it needs to be server-side render. So make sure that you're not using any you know, window ob uh, objects, uh, items, et cetera, that'll throw uh, basically when it runs in Node. And then you want to add linting for accessibility. This is just kind of table stakes these days. But um, yeah. So yeah, so uh, component rules, that's, it should be in quotes. Because again, take all this stuff with a grain of salt. Um, these are prop type conventions, where basically you want to keep things as minimal as possible. Avoid sprawl until you absolutely need it. Again, you can compose components together. That's what's great about them. Um, keep things minimal. Mirror the DOM wherever possible. So this one might be controversial to some, but if you are re like recreating um, attributes that sh like are basically the same thing as what the DOM already does, why are you making a developer learn your API versus just like, hey, this is how HTML works? Just it's it's very similar to how React Core works. They mirrored all of the DOM APIs, even if. Uh, yeah, I mean, if you're rendering in React Native, it might be slightly different, but um, follow good naming conventions. So, you know, if it's a Boolean value, you know, is filled, is open, has value, you know, don't just, you know, you know, add single word props that don't, don't uh, say what they are. Uh, add, add doc block comments above your prop types or your flow types or whatever. That's what... Um, React code gen uses to actually generate that doc, uh, automatic documentation. So if you don't have that, all you have is you know what your prop types are and the types of them, and not a, a useful description for human beings to read and figure out how to use them. Um, and then you want to avoid any like unnecessary abstractions. That's just kind of like just do just do that for everything, honestly. All right. So yeah, some final thoughts. Um, with this setup, we, we were able to achieve like a way faster development uh, velocity. <clears throat> and this you know, was propagated throughout like the eight or nine different product teams. Um, and it was just it was way better than maintaining. We, before this, we were maintaining like a bootstrap library that uh, was just kind of it was too big and had a lot of problems with it. Um, Individuals can work on isolated parts of the system. This is like the beauty of the component architecture. Uh, if one developer needs a certain use case, um, you can kind of discuss like, hey, does it belong just in your application or is it actually super useful for everyone? Um, and then you can kind of uh, promote that in. Um, you also, you know, with React, you have the ability to render this in multiple different targets. That's kind of a, a win here as well. Um, and then, yeah, we, we heavily rely on rendering like static um, like web stuff with our React components uh, just for better UX and indexability in search engines. And um, yeah, that's pretty much it. And you know, my future stack, the, the, where I ended up in my final destination, there is no final destination. We're always learning something new. <clears throat> but this is kind of my dream stack right now, where Redux, you know, now we got the context API, so I'm sure there'll be a talk on that later today. But um, yeah, so I'm doing a workshop on React and Serverless Friday. I'm going to be talking about how to use AWS Lambda and React together to build like ultra, ultra scalable systems, uh, if you're interested. And uh, yeah, thanks for listening. The slides are right there. And feel free to tweet at me with any questions of how we did this or any of the links, et cetera. And yeah, thanks for listening.